ladies and gentlemen uh, we've had our keynote address we've had our first individual presentation in our e-commerce track we now want to quickly move to our uh, e-commerce panel discussion uh, where we're going to be talking about the future of e-commerce and retail which revolves around exceptional customer experiences so before we actually begin the panel discussion i want to quickly introduce you to our esteemed panelists of the day uh we have with us uh, neha malhan head of retention at purple.com neha is an ex consultant from bcg turned e-commerce marketer with 6 plus years of experience in customer retention she has worked with india's leading fashion and beauty companies she loves solving problems across the user journey around personalization and customer growth across both app and web platforms a very warm welcome to you neha hi pradeep Hi, thank you for uh, inviting me here. It's been a pleasure to actually hear the previous speakers also speak uh, about retention and personalization, and hope right. to have a very, very uh, good discussion now as well. I have no doubt that will be the case. Our next uh, panelist today is Miss Anamel Nguyen from uh, uh, Chotot. She's the growth marketing lead at uh, Vietnam's leading e-commerce marketplace. She set up the first growth marketing team back in 2018, and uh, her team currently focuses on scaling user acquisition, activation, and retention for Chotot through the use of innovative technology, data, and creativity. Welcome to our panel discussion today, Anamel. Thank you so much for making the time. Um thank you Prado thanks for having me in the panelists um I'm I really impressed with all the presentations so far and I I hope that the panel will bring you a lot of informative um insight thank you Awesome so uh, we actually have a couple more panelists with us today uh, we also have uh, Shikan Chetlu the head of digital at uh, Matahari uh, the leading retail and e-commerce player in Indonesia and we also have mr maruti uh, ram gandhi the cpto at uh, bevkoof.com unfortunately they are having a few issues connecting at this stage uh, which means that uh, we would be delighted if they could make it to the event at certain points but uh, you know as they say the show must go on i think between anabel neha and me i think we're going to get some really really insightful pointers that would come out during this discussion so let's get this show on the road uh my first question to you ladies is um you know we've spoken about omni channel personalization that has emerged as a major conversion catalyst and pillar for great customer experiences particularly in e-commerce over the last few years so uh neha as a rapidly growing e-commerce subcategory in the cosmetics and beauty domain how does purple view personalization thank you thank you pratik so uh, personalization i think is one of the buzzwords uh, that keeps getting thrown around and what it typically means uh, for something like a purple uh, where uh, it's a beauty player is a little different versus say uh, when i was in say mintra and what it meant for fashion so uh, to put things in perspective for beauty everyone's skin looks different right. is different uh from the texture to the concern so even if you had say a combination or a dry skin uh your issues might be acne or pigmentation or something else so beauty right. inherently as a category uh is very very aligned to the fact that personalization is where uh it helps to help conversions or even engagement going so for personalization in purple uh, particularly what we look at is uh trying to figure out you know who needs to get what at when and it is at one of the cores of what we do and how we do it so i look at uh, platform marketing which involves what goes on the app and the web and what goes on the crm channels and uh, even in the digital marketing domain as well and all of this uh, beautifully ties in to make that customer journey happen because uh, say you bought something or you're considering to buy something then there are so it's different for a new user so because you need to allay the fears of the fact that he's buying something online instead of offline uh he needs a lot more social proofing and say reviews uh, to say that you know real customers feel xyz about the product the rating of the product is such and uh, then there are certain things like expert reviews there are influencers which a person usually like in the beauty space so even though they might buy online they might have seen that particular product with a friend or offline in a mall and now with covid uh, coming in a lot of people are not able to try these things out so that personalization is where it helps them to get to the product 
so you might be a herbal ingredient enthusiast with the same dry skin problem and uh, looking to solve it with say two products one a serum and a face wash and uh, i can recommend to you like all herbal products all herbal brands and that is where uh, i will lead your journey for so someone who's also got the same problem of dry skin but is okay using uh, say chemical exfoliants and is uh, using hyaluronic acid and stuff like that so all of this is actually uh, very contextual and uh, usable uh, at uh, purple yeah awesome Oh, so we are uh, Shrikant. Thank you so much for uh, joining in. Great to have you on the panel. Uh, we kick started the conversation around omni-channel personalization and how it's a major conversion catalyst. I uh, wanted to know from you, Shrikant, specifically, how is it at Matahari, especially a company that uh, operates both in the offline and online retail space? How are you guys being able to deliver these personalized customer experiences? Right. Uh- Good afternoon, everybody. Apologies for being late. I think the the, the event got delayed a bit. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, now, interesting question. Um, so, it's been very uh, important for us initially to establish a single view of customer. So, what that enabled us was that we were able to uh, look at how our customers were reacting with our brand across uh, multiple channels, be it uh, our direct to customer channels of uh, brick and mortar or our uh, our e-commerce, as well as uh, some of the other partnerships and affiliations we have with uh, with with uh, with the overall ecosystem in Indonesia. So, uh, what we what we do uh, for personalization uh, is, is more about uh, we set up customer personas, uh, and uh, rather than we we do use RFM techniques and other techniques, but we we try to now work towards uh, customer personas which are based on our historical data because uh, fortunately our loyalty program is one of the biggest loyalty programs in Indonesia, close to 8 million active users. Uh, so what that enables us is that uh, it gives us a really rich data of our customers and which goes all the way back to uh, back to decades because we have our loyal customers all this while. And with the, with the digital adoption, it gets even more interesting because we know how the whole research online purchase offline aspects we can start seeing. Uh, considering we, we've done all our integrations with regards to uh, the point of sale as well as our digital channel integrations, which is all coming in together in a MarTech engine. So, so that helps us to understand where our customers are, how they're interacting. And then once, uh, once we know we get that data from the POS with regards to this shopping behavior, uh, and also the frequency, uh, that, that, that helps us to create some tailor-made uh, segmentations within on-site journeys where we, we try to do uh, a lot more on the product recommendation side. Uh, uh, we try to, to try to create some bespoke solutions around the homepage itself. Uh, on the homepage side on personalization, we're still uh, in a pilot phase, uh, but on the product recommendation side uh, with, uh, and shop the look side, we, we have started doing a lot of these AIs, uh, which is uh, gathering in data for our, our customers across channels. So that, that's been very powerful for us. We're yet to go to uh, the ideal scenario of one one is to one targeting, right. but I, I think it, it it has to be a journey. Uh, based on my experience, it's not something you can do overnight. So it is important for you to set the precedence right, start looking into uh, your your active customers, how they behave with you with your brand across channels, and then uh, try to create clusters and zones and try to uh, then manage them accordingly after you create these personas. Amazing, amazing insights, especially, uh, you know, for a company like yours, where it's so critical to develop that unified customer view across both offline and online channels. And it puts so much more emphasis on you developing that solid customer data platform in place that helps you create those engagement and retention strategies in the future. Awesome. Uh, I now come to Miss Annabel. Uh, how does Chotot personalize digital user experiences at scale, especially in an increasingly tech savvy market like Vietnam? Thanks for the question. So um, a thought personalization is always at our core strategy for growth. So the key to personalization for us is lying in the combination of data, user-centric mindset, uh, marketing technology tool, and creativity. So we are using machine learning to recommend products that our users are looking for. Um, Sounds like similar like what Neha had just told, share with everyone. 
depending on the stage of user and their shopping behavior, we are recommending products that they are looking for, uh, products that they might interest on and want to explore. So the other pillar we are focusing on is through what we call user relationship management. So like customer, but user in our sense, which includes uh, push notifications, email, in-app, and SMS, like messaging. So we're striving for personalization in communication through the most simple one, like uh, we mentioned the username in the push notification sending to people or to more complicated things like the weather of the mm -hmm. certain regions as our user across the country. So the most sophisticated one, like what we call personal shopping assistance. So when we play different support along purchase journeys to help you to find the right item in the most effective way. So just imagine because we are the marketplace, people can come to our platform with different purpose. We, if we know that the user A is likely researching the market, not yet buying yet, but, but they want to research how the price of the certain products look like. So if we identify that person, we point them to the features uh, price comparison. So all of that um, personalization has been set to trigger by the user actions or stage to ensure the real time services we provide. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I think that point that you mentioned about personal shopping assistance that that is continuing to grow in popularity, especially in, uh, you know, the Indian and Southeast Asia region as well. Uh, we do something similar for a lot of our e-commerce brands, something along those lines where we create a personalized boutique or a virtual storefront. And it's composed of only those products that a user is most likely to click on, add to cart and purchase. So uh, it's, uh, it's similar in that sense because it's a specially curated list of only those products that are most relevant to a user. So we do that for a lot of our e-commerce customers as well. Thank you so much for those amazing insights. Uh, we come to our next question. You know, so by the end of 2021, they say that mobile devices are expected to contribute almost 70% of e-commerce transactions. Now, in this backdrop, uh, are you treating your users on your mobile site and your app differently? And what's been working for you guys in terms of retention? Uh, either one of you, um, any one of you can choose to answer this first. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. So let, let me, let me take a dig on that. Sure. Uh, so, uh, no, it's true about the, the whole st statistics behind the 70% mobile penetration. In fact, for us in Matahari, we're talking about 85%. Uh, that's, that's, that's the level of, uh, mobile and how important it is. And, and mobile is not just about the app, right? It's the true. mobile web as well. Uh, which is equally critical, uh, uh, uh because in that, in, in usually that becomes your primary uh, primary uh, channel for traffic, though the conversions can be a lot higher on the app. Uh, so so the, the way we have been seeing that is uh, 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 from, from a day to day trading aspect, from a commercial aspect, we try to we try to try to monetize as much as we can on the app by 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 allowing, let's say, any particular products or promotions which are visible only if you download the app and view it. Uh, we have been doing that and that's been very successful because we know the conversions are much better out there and uh, that is an enough mo uh, motivation or incentive for a customer to go all the way and uh, download the app. Uh, so that that's one. But in an omni-channel setup, um, mobile also becomes a very important communication channel. So uh, we talked about the loyalty part in the last question. So we were able to create uh, the digital loyalty card for our customers. So uh, and which complements the physical loyalty card, which has been there for ages, right? So, so that is further helping us because that creates uh, all these uh, technologies which we're able to leverage, let's say notifications, with regards to every time they, they earn a point or they burn a point or uh, with our, with our uh, extended uh, ecosystem of services, which we provide, which can go beyond Matahari for the Matahari loyalty customers is something which is uh, getting displayed out there for customers to, to see what their rewards can translate into. Uh, so there is this whole communication aspect, which becomes very critical to tap into all those traditional uh, brick and mortar customers and trying to transition them to digital uh, uh, because it is absolutely cost-effective, right? When you think right. of it, when you think from a large scale point of view, 
the, the amount of the amount of money you got to spend in terms of doing some sort of ATLs uh, to drive that customer. You want to do TVCs and all the traditional media which you have to conduct to to bring in traffic to your stores. Now you get mobile, which is literally all these these are very organic ones. If you want to do push notifications, if you want to do any of the other CRM aspects, it doesn't really cost you that much of money. So, so that's how we have been seeing, and it's very important for businesses of our size or of our setup where there's a very healthy balance between brick and mortar and online uh, that they need to complement each other rather than cannibalize each other. So this is where we're, we're trying to see that how this app is not just from a shopping standpoint, but also a great medium of communication uh, and being in touch with our customers. So, so yeah, I, I mobile, mobile continues to be uh, one of the most important channels. And uh, I think in markets like Southeast Asia and India, it is, it is, it's such, a, such an important asset uh, for, for all the companies. And it's very important for them to have a mobile first strategy. Uh, mm. I, I think without that, uh, it, 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 it becomes extremely difficult otherwise. Yeah. True. I think very, very key point that you made there, uh, where your mobile app isn't just for the sake of driving conversions, but it becomes a vital platform and consequent channel for customer engagement as well. And the fact that all of this needs to be a very cohesive ecosystem where cannibalization is not, uh, you know, the agenda, it's more about how you can leverage each of these to drive the same agenda. So awesome points there. Um, either Annabelle or Neha, you guys want to chime in here. What are your thoughts on this? Absolutely. I actually uh, wanted to just add a couple of things. Like uh, sure. in India, at least, I've been working in uh, app first companies where app forms more than the 70% uh, revenue share and uh, two structural things that I would want to talk about. Sure. One, mobile is a very personal device. You might not be carrying your laptops, etc., everywhere but you're carrying your mobiles and you're used to a certain kind of behavior and the categories we are in, some of these are not need based. There some of them are impulse based. So it's just like a time pass thing that you would come and um, want to engage, want to learn more. Uh, just also browse and add to cart and probably keep it for the end of the month or the start of the month to shop. So that is one. The second fundamental thing uh, being app first, what we've realized is there are certain structural things that an app lends us to do like gamification lends beautifully on the apps compared to web uh, the fact that there is a range of your thumbs so your designs your ui ux uh, the readability the fact that a scroll is less costly versus a, uh, a vertical scroll is less costly versus say a horizontal scroll so all of these are like some of those decisions which help us also create more user first user led uh, ways for him to ease his navigation and even create impulse so it is easy to do like a swipe and get like a gamification action done on a mobile and then also reward people on a very or a, a very simple thing like a scratch card so all of these are like those growth hacks that lend very beautifully to this device platform and us being app first also like uh, Shrikant mentioned the fact that you have the app and you have it logged in gets you that one exact direct point of contact to reach sure. out and also trace it back. So with all your other channels, you are not able to trace that, you know, I did some marketing and RNF campaign and uh, some people would have come, but they would show us direct audience or direct installs. So that way uh, in India, at least the app first bit helps both ends of the business, both the customer and the uh, people who are marketing as well. A very interesting point there that you mentioned uh, about how being mobile first actually opens up an entire Pandora's box of data points for you. And these data points actually go on to connect the dots that you want to when you're building that seamless user experience across platforms and channels. Awesome. Uh, all right. Uh, in the due interest of time and also because this is supposed to be a breezy, insightful session, I'm going to move to my final question for you guys. Um, so delivering triggered personalized emails or push notifications is important for customer engagement. You know, that's something that's a given it's uh, established. The absence of this can actually lead to either drop-offs in terms of your app usage, or it could also lead to uninstalls. So I just want to understand from your point of view, what steps are you taking at the brand level to um, prevent this from happening? We'll start with Miss Annabelle. Thank you. So um, I absolutely agree with you on the importance of trigger personalized notifications. 
I remember when we interview users about how they feel about notifications. And I remember almost all of them say they hate notification. So not a surprise, right? But when we went on to dig a little bit deeper, we found that they don't really hate notifications. They just hate the notifications that are irrelevant. That became the motto for our, for our CRM killer, how, how to make the notifications and email more relevant, even more than that, how to make users actually happy when receiving notifications from us. So what we are doing is like four steps. The first one is like mapping user journeys to identify which moment that your thoughts should facilitate. The second one is enriching user data. So we try to collect more user data to really understand that moment how it can be quantified um, and, and recognized on our platform when it comes to data. The third step is like reorganize our data structures on, on Brace. We use Brace as a marketing automation platform. So, and finally, we adding a little bit personality spices for the notification copy. So it actually really uh, specific for, for thought only and it make people can smile when they receive notifications. So, I can give you one example. Sure. The most successful push notification loop that my team has built is uh, we call safe ad loops. So basically when a product we call is uh, an ad be saved by buyers, we push to seller telling them that their product has been saved by a lot of people and getting a lot of attention. Do you want to consider lowering the price a little bit to sell faster? And when the seller lower the price, we again send push to buyers saying that the ads they have saved actually now at being lower price, come by before it's gone. So with that, we are able to facilitate the purchase effectiveness between like buyer and seller while gaining our daily active user at the same time. And our user absolutely love it. Some people even like um, very much like actively subscribe for our push notification to receive that kind of push notifications. So um, yeah, that is one of the most example that we think uh, contextual personal life trigger is very good. But um, in our experience, also not own personal life contextual notification got positive performance. So right. we once ran a campaign calling horoscope in which we said like weekly fortune telling to either to say like how the week would look like and suggesting the category of the product that match the vibe of the week that personalized for them because it's made on their the birthday. The result were actually good for the first few weeks. And then the direct open rate keep dropping. And okay. then we optimized for a few rounds, but we didn't really see much improvement from that. So we had to decide to drop the campaign the big key lesson learned, like even though is it personalized, is it contextualized, is it, uh, it is fun, but if it does not bring direct benefits to user, it shouldn't last. So yeah, basically uh, our makes, story. Makes a, makes a very, you made a lot of interesting points there because uh, at the end of the day, of course, you get to understand more about your customer behavior by studying the data points that are coming in. Uh, the fact that you mentioned that it has to be tied with direct benefit or value. That's the only reason why they would benefit from communication of that sort. And also, you know, how you build a brand personality and communicate that over a channel like push notifications. You know, you want to be quirky, you want to be funny, you want to be sarcastic, humor. It, it, it's There's just like an entire gamut of uh, emotions that you can convey. So really interesting points there. Uh, Shrikant, Neha, either one of you want to take a final stab at this one? All right, ladies first. Neha, please. Neha, there you go. Uh, I think uh, I'll just add one thing to it. Uh, there are different types of triggers and notifications for different goals. True. As long as that is maintained, they will give that purpose. So what happens is sometimes we get into the trap of getting into only revenue. Some of those might just be engagement triggers. I might not send a flat X percent off or a coupon. I might just want to make you see how the product looks or how it gets used or how it could probably, you know, combine with your beauty routine to exactly benefit you. And in that case, I should only be measuring it on say the engagement it drives may not drive a next purchase. So that is just one uh, additional thing. And that is the goal definition defines the trajectory of this personalization. So we might just not chase after the wrong metrics in the hope of saying that, you know, the personalization's end goal is only going to be revenue. True. 
I think uh, the fact that you tie the objective of the triggered campaign with the benefit that you're trying to deliver and you map the right metrics because at times you're just sending out a transactional message which may be personalized because it's related to an order. Uh, at times you are informing users about you know, an item that's come back into stock. So the objective would vary, the metrics would vary accordingly. Thank you so much for sharing that, Neha. So maybe, maybe I'll, I'll just add one last sure. comment. Please. Go ahead, Shikhan. I, I think it, it should go out for, uh, it's very uh, industry agnostic and everybody uh, should, should, and it's an overarching theme that you got to do a hell, whole lot of A-B testing on this. There is no right solution. Uh, sure. Some campaigns can work wonderfully well, some may not. Uh, and with some personas, it may work out, some may not. It, it really depends. So I think uh, having A-B testing capabilities is absolutely critical in today's time to, to really play around. Uh, and then uh, you gotta you got to understand what is your core area and what are those customers who's going to drive it. And then your your most affluent customers and your most important customers, True. Uh, you need to you need to have a separate process altogether for that. Like I'll your, just your power that. users, or uh, you know, tying it back to the concept of velvet rope marketing. Like exactly, it's sim exactly. So Netaporte is one of those examples, right? So they've got uh, four percent of the total customer base drive seventy percent of revenues. They they call them EIP, extremely important, important people. people. Right. So, so I, I think it, it becomes very important. May not be a, a four to seventy percent, maybe a twenty to eighty. You never know. It really depends. But I think uh, doing A/B testing and then having a a, 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 a a different course of action for maybe your absolutely loyal customers or your repeat customers is something uh, one should also consider. Awesome. So I think if I could quickly summarize what we discussed today uh, around uh, you know our conversation, we spoke about the importance of omni-channel personalization, but not to do it just for the sake of it. It's got to be making sense uh, as to why you are deploying it across channels and platforms, how it's important to reconcile your data points across both offline, online, just sort of like create that CDP that becomes your foundation for personalization and engagement. Uh, we spoke about the key role that a mobile app would play for an e-commerce player um, and solve specific use cases, how a mobile heavy app would, uh, or rather brand would actually leverage it for use cases like in-app gamification uh, to drive engagement, etc. How a brand that has both an offline and online presence such as Matahari would look at it as both a conversion catalyst, but also for customer engagement. Uh, we spoke about the importance of uh, targeted uh, push notification campaigns, triggered push notification campaigns, how it's important to study the data, create a strategy that suits segments of your customers, right? whether it's the EIP or uh, whether you want to uh, create targeted campaigns around certain other segments, study data segment and uh, tie back your benefit to the objective and uh, track the right metrics. So. Thank you so much, guys, for uh, being a part of this panel discussion. Um, I hope you guys had as much fun as I did learning and exchanging thoughts, of course. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to be here. Thanks to the Netco team, Pradyut, uh, and, uh, and, and Annabelle, Neha. Lovely, lovely meeting you guys. Thanks, Shikan. Thanks, Annabelle. And thank you, Neha, for joining us. Thanks, Pradyut. Thanks, Neha, for joining us.